Okay, hello, welcome to the video version of the lecture, and uh, I hope you remember not to go to the lecture hall itself because this these lectures this week are online only. So I'm glad you found the video. So let me um, continue on uh, the story that I was telling last time. We were talking about ordinary differential equations, and I described what Euler stepping, Euler's method is, and I was also describing these event functions. We're going to put it all together in this lecture. Um, so just reviewing what we were doing last time, <clears throat> we have these, remember the driving, the novelty driving range, golf driving range model. We define these event functions. Um, one, this one here was basically goes from positive to negative when the ball hits the ground, assuming the ground is at y equals zero. And then I defined a couple other event functions, well, a couple versions of the same event anyway, of hitting the barrier. This first one is not so good because it's discontinuous. It goes from, whoops, it goes from being equal to positive one to being equal to negative one in a discontinuity. The second one is better because it goes continuously from positive to negative. So the, the numerical integrator has more information at, uh, to try to figure out where the exact crossing is, and it tries to actually estimate the location of the exact event. It tries to give you a, a sample at that point. Um, <clears throat> so um, let's look at the, the other model. One of the other models that we talked about is the pursuit model. Um, the, we want to terminate the pursuit model when the missile catches the jet or um, when the fox catches the rabbit, let's say. Basically, we want to terminate when the pursuer catches the target. P-U-R-S-U-E-R. -E and so we'll be, we'll, <clears throat> we'll basically say there's like a, some radius of uh, uh, effect for that. We'll say D min, like the, the, um, the distance minimum. So as long as the pursuer is within a minimum distance, d min of that target, then we'll say it's been captured. So we, what we want is basically around the target, a cone that goes down and passes through zero at this ring of, uh, of radius d min and then goes negative inside. So we're kind of looking at something like this. The target's here, and we've got this cone that goes up and passes through zero with the radius of d min. That's the sort of thing we're looking at. So that event function, <coughs> ETZ equals the distance between, uh, sorry, well, the distance at this I defined earlier. It's a distance from the pursuer to the target minus d min. So, uh, i.e., the per, no, I'm spelling it differently now. Per sewer is within d min of target. Okay, so that's a continuous event function. It goes from positive when the, when the pursuer is farther away, it goes to negative when the pursuer crosses within d min of the target. That will trigger the event. <clears throat> okay, so let me just quickly talk about the s general system architecture for these numerical solvers. So it has these different pieces that go into it. First is the input. So this is the part that you would supply. You have to get it, give it the dynamics function. We talked a lot about that. You also have to give it an initial state. And you have to give it start and end times. Or at least start and end values of your independent variable. Now those go into those get fed into the ODE solver. Now we haven't really seen many, but so far we've seen uh, well today I'll point out uh, in more detail, or in the, actually the next lecture, solve IVP. But there are others, um, Runga Kutta 4.5 and Runga Kutta 
three, four. These are just different names for a numerical uh, ODE solver functions. Every, uh, every sort of numerical ODE solving suite has um, a variety of these different methods. And the actual function that you call to access those might have different names from time to time. We're going to use one called solve IVP. Um, Python actually has other ODE solvers available with different names. They just have different ways of calling them. And solve IVP was kind of most consistent with the history of this course. OK, <clears throat> so that's solver. It's going to do this time-stepping loop. And like I described for the Euler's method, but it's, got, it's not just Euler's method. It has more sophisticated methods. But they're all time-stepping. In those time steps, there are multiple calls made to the dynamics function. So for example, in Euler's method, you have to call the dynamics function repeatedly to find out what the slope is, and then you use that to take a step. <clears throat> Every step, though, it also calls the event function, or the event functions, if there are any. Every time step saying, are all the events still positive, or have any events been triggered? So that happens repeatedly every time step. And then once it's all done, it outputs <clears throat> the sort of the solution. And that usually takes the, uh, yes, I should go into do not disturb. Thank you. My, I just got a notification on my screen. The output is an array of times or values of the independent variable, and an array of states. The solution. So this is the state that, you're, that your system was in at whatever time. OK, so that's what the sort of overall architecture looks like. Let's look at a specific implementation of that now. Let's talk about the um, SciPy's interface for the ODE suite. OK. So SciPy's ODE suite, there's a, a SciPy module called integrate. And it has a function called solve IVP, which I've talked about. It's a wrapper for a number of different ODE solvers, I mentioned Rungakata 4.5, Rungakata 3.4, there's Euler's method, a modified Euler's, there's a whole bunch of different methods. There are some kind of standard textbook ones that are, <clears throat> that are baked into this. Um, but even there are, there are all sorts of methods that aren't even included in that. It's a very uh, elaborate field, but we don't need to concern ourselves with all those bells and whistles. So solve IVP is a wrapper for a number of different numerical time-stepping methods. Um, you don't even I mean, often you don't even know which method you're calling, and that's 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 okay as long as you're not as long as your problem's not too specific. Okay, so to call solve IVP, we need to set up a standard. Uh, we have to set up the initial value problem in standard form. So we have to create the dynamics function. So for example, I don't want that. I want this. I could have a function called simple de. I'll use that in the examples here. And it's going to be a function of time and state. I need to set the initial state. So for example, I could set z0 equals 1. And then I need to choose start and end times. So I usually call it t-span. It's not just me. Lots of People call it T-span. So for example, from 0 to 1, I could integrate. Then I need to use those to call the ODE solver. So the ODE solver, um, I'll say sol, and I'll explain that in a second, is solve whoops, underscore IVP. Um, uh, depending on how you import the SciPy integrate library, you might have to include SciPy integrate solve IVP, or you could say from SciPy integrate import solve IVP, then you could just use solve IVP without having to give it the sort of modules it comes from. I think you probably understand that stuff better than I do. Anyway, so there's solve IVP, <clears throat> and we have to give it three main arguments. The first one 
is the dynamics function, which I called simple DE. Next one is the time interval, or the interval for the independent variable. And the last one is the initial state. Pretty simple. So you can check the function's help for more information. But I'll just put some notes here. Dynamic, dynamics function. This is the start end. So T span is a two tuple or a two array. And this is the initial state. OK. Now once, it's <clears throat> once that runs, it'll put the, uh, what it computes into this variable sol. So sol is a data structure. It's basically, uh, I believe it's a class or an object. And it contains a whole bunch of information, including the timestamps, the array of timestamps, and the array of states that correspond to those timestamps. But it also includes other things. Um, things about like why it terminated, did any events uh, get triggered, um, what were the, I'm not sure what else is in there, but there's all sorts of stuff in there. Okay, so let's interpret this one's output. So typically what you do, I mean if, you, if you want to view it, you plot it. So you could, for example, plot, now let's say I want to plot uh, y versus t. Sol has a variable in it, or a member called t, which has is the array of timestamps. And it also has an array of states called y. And I might want to plot only the first coordinate. So y0, um, y, let me put it this way, yk holds the time series for um, dynamic variable, state variable. index k. So um, <clears throat> it's a two-dimensional array, but the rows can each row contains one variable, basically, the whole time series of one variable. Or I might want to plot two variables against each other, like x versus y, for example, in which case I would go plot sol y0 versus sol y1. That would be like an x versus y. And who knows, whatever is in your state, you might choose to plot it some different way. So let's look at an, an example. Here's my simple DE. I've got my differential equation here, and I've got my initial state. And here's my dynamics function. Simple DE, it takes t and y as input, and it returns t minus y. So we've seen this thing before. And I call solve IV, IVP with my dynamics function, my t-span and my initial state is, I'm setting my initial value of y to 1. And it comes out, um, puts the answer in sol, and here I'm plotting sol, and you, that's what you see over here on the right. Okay, so I'll show some examples, uh, some more interesting uh, models um, when I bring up my own Jupyter Notebook in a few minutes. Uh, well, let's do it now, actually. So here's my script, my uh, notebook. And you can see I'm uh, from SciPy, integrate, import solve IVP. So I can use solve IVP without having all those, that sort of bunch of words before it. I'm not sure what divide equals ignore means. I think it was, that was a layover from the floating point stuff. So here's my dynamics function for the golf. You've already seen this. And I set up my parameters, t-span, um, my initial state, and vx is uh, 25. So vx is just like a global, it's on the global scope, so it just works in there. I'll talk a bit about that more in, in a few minutes. Call the solver. There, it's done, it's really quick. So when I say what type sol is, it's an ODE result, whatever that is. If you view what's in sol, you can see it's a bunch of stuff. There's a message, there's a success, and I guess it's, if it's not successful, maybe it encountered nans and infs and stuff like that. 
Um, there's t and there's y. You can see the y has three rows. That's because there are three state variables. Um, there are no events. I'm not sure what these other things mean. So this one took eight time steps, and you can see all eight time steps here. And there's a solution, uh, the y. I'm just, I'm just showing you different pieces of it. And we can plot. This is the x versus y version of it. Um, if I plotted it, oh, this is golf, right? The golf model. So how long, how long did I run it for? 10 seconds. So after 10 seconds, the ball goes up and then <laughs> it plummets way down. So um, it's worth looking at how big the time steps are. Um, like if we look at the time steps here, it took eight steps. Um, first few steps were tiny, and then it takes these giant steps, like 0.38 seconds, 3.8 seconds, one full, uh, 10 seconds. The last step was a full 10 seconds in size. <laughs> That's because it's using a higher order method that we'll talk about later, um, but it's really good at, uh, it's not just a linear approximation like an Euler's method. It's a it's a higher order approximation which can fit something like uh, uh, ballistic trajectory really closely. Um, that may not be very helpful in terms of uh, plotting, but we'll I'll, we'll talk about ways around that in a bit. And finally, you can get the state of the system at the end by asking for give me all the state variables at the last time step. So the x was 250, the y was negative 340, and then and the y velocity was negative 83.1 meters per second. Okay. So <clears throat> that's the, those are the basics of how you call solve IVP. But solve IVP has a lot of um, little bells and whistles built into it. Lots of ways that you can control um, the way it runs and the way you can control the output that it gives you. One thing that sort of came up in the golf model is the fact that we had this Vx that we were just putting in the global scope and basically importing it globally. So what if we wanted to use Vx as an additional parameter to our dynamics function? So in other words, what if our dynamics function has more than two parameters, not just t and state, but also other stuff like Vx? So I pointed out that in our previous case, we had Vx in here, but that was just on the global uh, on the global stack, but we can pass Vx through as a parameter if we want. So now you can see I've included Vx in the list of parameters. It wasn't here before, so that's that's kind of more elegant to do it that way. So how do we get? Because we're not calling the, this dynamics function. We are not the the solver is calling the dynamics function. So the solver needs to know, um, know a little bit more about what arguments our dynamics function is expecting. So there are two ways to do this. So now we've, by adding this Vx, we've basically broken the contract that this dynamics function has just two inputs, because now ours expects three. So how do we handle this? A couple ways you can do it. First, I'll talk about the, the, the first way I figured out how to do it, um, and then I'll tell you the right way to do it. <laughs> um, the first way to do it is to just create a wrapper. So you can go ahead and set... Um, so I'm creating this um, wrapper function that takes Tx as input, and I'm just setting... basically hard coding that input. I'm creating another function around it that that all presets the, um, that parameter. I'd say, um, so once you do that, then this new function can be used as the input to solve IVP, the new dynamics function. Um, there's actually a better way to do it, and I'll just write it over here, um, because there is a facility, there is a key argument, uh, key, one of the inputs for solve IVP allows you to do that. So, um, We'll say or use args like this. So you can say sol equals solve IVP, all the regular stuff. Um, 
we'll just say function, who cares what the function is, t span z0 or z0. Now, after this, you can have a bunch of uh, key value pairs, and we'll talk about a number of different ones. One of them, one of the key value pairs is args. So this is basically allows you to list a whole bunch of things that you can pass through. However many, whatever there's in this args list, I'll put a 20 here like this, is what gets passed through as additional parameters into your dynamics function. So if I expected two additional arguments to my dynamics, my dynamics function, I should then have two things in my args list. Okay, so they have to match. They have to have the same number. So that's kind of the better way to do it, I'd say. So there are other things you can, uh, let's see, do I have, yes, okay. Let's look at that. So here's the, um, the simple golf. This is version two now. It's a different dynamics function because now we have this extra argument here. So first I'm showing the, um, the wrapper function thing. So I'm taking t and x as input, but I'm actually hard coding this third parameter. And so I get what I want, okay? I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, <clears throat> the other option is to, let's create a copy of that. The other option is to call simple golf two. Oh, this is the other option I've already, so I could have run it like this, come down here, and I get that as a result. So that was running this wrapper version. Or this is the version with the args, and it gives the same answer, not surprisingly. See that this one's calling fun, it's the wrapper, and this one's calling the original one with the extra parameter. Okay, if I were you, I'd probably use this second method. Okay. You get it. Now there are other controls, other key value pairs that solve IVP accepts. Um, wait, I should be doing a joke at some point. Let me pick a joke from my repository. I like this one. This is from a, a comedian named Stephen Wright. He's a really famous, or at least he was famous, for like really short one-liner jokes. And he said, um, he was uh, driving and his friend said to him, have you ever fallen asleep while driving? And he said, no. I've woken up while driving though. Okay, so there are other events and options that you can specify um, using the uh, key value pairs. So when calling the ODE solver, you might need to set up some of the options that govern how the solver behaves. For example, events. We haven't talked about, talked about how we get events in there. So somehow we have to tell about event functions. Um, error tolerances. Tolerances. Um, step sizes that's related to error tolerances. Step sizes, output spacing, and a whole bunch of other things. If you look at the help for Solve IVP, you'll see that there are a whole bunch of different things you can specify. So these are all set as key value pairs in the solver, in the call to Solve IVP. So for example, to specify the maximum step size we would say sol equals solve IVP. By the way, you don't always have to call it sol. You can call it whatever you want. I just typically call it sol. Simple golf t span uh, y0 for my initial state and max underscore step equals 0 0.5. And as you can probably guess, what that does is it, it doesn't allow a time step greater than half a second. I guess one thing I haven't mentioned is that these methods, I mean, I guess I have mentioned it, but not really formally introduced you to the idea that 
these time stepping methods adjust the time step to try to um, take as few time steps as possible. Now what that's based on I'll talk about in the next lesson but for now just accept that it's adjusting the time step so you can get a whole like you can get a variety of different time step sizes. You can ask it to say do not take you can ask it to not take a time step greater than max step which in this case is 0.5. You can specify the event function. Why don't I just copy all this? Copy. Paste. Now it's going to be a jerk. Okay, there we go. So I've got that, but now in the key value pair I'm going to put is events equals um, my event I guess so my event is a f an event function that I've written okay um, if you have more than one event function you put them in a list I think maybe even one can go in a list I'm not sure maybe I can try that so let's look at a full example uh, well actually let's before we do that let's look at uh, let's continue with these um, looking at these controls so here's the max step of 0.5, the thing I was just writing down. If we use a max step of 0.5, you can see the solution is more finely sampled. Um, interestingly, you can see right at the end here, it does a couple of short time steps. That's because it's, it was taking big time steps, and once it reached the end, it had to take a shorter one because it reached the end of the t values it was supposed to model. But if you look at these, they are in fact 0.5 seconds, so it's, it's recognized that it it can easily take 0.5 seconds and stay accurate. So 1.88, 2.38, 2.88, they're five second increments. They're 0.5 second increments. Uh, just because this is a fairly smooth and well behaved model. It won't always be like that. Um, you can choose um, what specific times you want the solution to be evaluated at. And it'll adjust the time steps so that it hits the times that you ask for. So here I'm asking for from from the start time to the end time, I want to know what the state is every 0.2 seconds. And so it spits out the times, uh, the state, sorry, at every 0.2 seconds inter intervals. And if I listed sol.t, it, it would in fact see that it was 0.2 increments. Um, now choosing error tolerances. This is a little bit of a tricky thing. Now there are two different types of error tolerances. There's relative tolerance and absolute tolerance. And these correspond to relative error and absolute error just the way we've been talking about it all through the course. Now, <clears throat> um, in the next lecture I'll talk about how, it, how these methods can estimate the error. Um, there's a way for these methods to kind of come up with some idea of how much error there is in the solution it's found. And a certain amount of error is inevitable. So what we have to do is set some tolerance for how much error we're, we're okay with. And then it compares our tolerance level with its estimate of the error. And if the, if the estimate of the error is bigger than our tolerance, it dials it back. It takes a shorter time step. We'll talk about that next lecture. Um, now the absolute tolerance, it, basically you're setting a, to, a, a threshold on the absolute error. So, um, you know, if you have some model where you're, you're modeling the movement of the planets and you have state variables that are like 10 to the 10 to the 5 or something in size, you know, versus you're modeling the, the you know, movement of, of uh, molecules or something, you might have measurement or state variables that are 10 to the minus 6. You know, the absolute error in those two different systems is going to be hugely different. So, if you're using absolute tolerance, you'd have to be aware of the scale of your size of problem and choose your absolute tolerance to fit your scale. That's why relative tolerance is nice because it's more like saying, well, I'm willing to uh, allow a, a 2% error or a, a 0.01% error in my uh, solution. So you can actually specify one of them or both of them. In fact, they both have default values. The thing to know about them, though, is that the um, as long as the solution, as long as its error estimate satisfies one of them, 
it's okay with it and it allows that time step to pass. It's only if it fails both that it takes a shorter time step and tries again. Okay, so, so let me demonstrate that. Here I'm running this, uh, this simple, I guess this is the gulf. Oh no, it's this, it's this differential equation up here, whatever that is. It's running it, tw it's running it twice with different error tolerances. One is very sort of liberal. These are fairly large, it's like 10 to the minus two is a fairly large error. And then this is fairly like more strict. You can see um, the more tolerant one is plotted in red. You can see it takes bigger time steps in red. And the more strict one has to take shorter time steps because um, the, its estimate of its error, it goes up as you take a larger time step. So it's got to take smaller time steps to keep its error estimate small to satisfy those tolerances. So the blue one, notice if I, if I am more relaxed about my relative tolerance on the blue curve, rerun it, now suddenly, even though the absolute tolerance is really strict, I loosen the relative tolerance and I get these big time steps. Just for fun, let me try switching those. Huh. So it seems like the absolute tolerance was the actual uh, bottleneck that was um, dictating this, the time stepping, this, the time spacing of the first solution. Okay, so <clears throat> you get the idea there. Um, if you have some reason that you need to, you have to keep your error tolerances within a certain range, that's one way to do it. Event functions. So here's how you do an event function. Yes, you define uh, the event function itself. It takes t and z as input. Um, okay, I'll talk about something. Yeah, okay. Yes, you take, it takes t and z as input and you output a scalar representing the value of the event. This would be the golf ball hitting the ground. But you also have to, you can, or you have to define these uh, two extra um, attributes of your function. So you can actually have a function, but you can add attributes to your function like this. So my event dot terminal true. This tells the ODE solver that once it, when this event gets triggered, it should stop integrating. You can say false and it'll it'll trigger the event and it'll report the time the event happened, but it'll just keep going. Um, you also can control whether the event specifically is looking for the event function going from positive to negative or from negative to positive, or if you don't care whether it's going positive, negative, or negative. You just care. You, you want a, the event to trigger at any zero crossing. Um, we're typically going to use it only for things going from positive to negative, but it's um, but just so you know, you have control over this particular um, aspect of the event. And so I'm using the wrapper version of my function this time, symbol golf, but I'm creating a ver another version of it. And let's see, it should stop when it hits the ground. Sure enough, it goes up, fairly big time steps, and it comes down. You can see just at the end, it takes a, a couple, it takes a smaller time step. That's because it took a big time step, realized the event function evaluated to negative, and then it backed up and then did some sort of process to estimate when the actual zero of the event happens. That's why, and it can make a much smarter decision if it knows the actual event values and if the event changes in a continuous manner from positive to negative. Um, yeah, and you can ask for, whoops, that's not what I wanted. Uh, oh, this is the this is the y value. You can see that it's like within round off error, pretty much of zero. Um, so something I should point out is that if the the signature calling signature to you to your event function, because um, remember you're not calling your dynamics function and you're also not calling your event function. It's the ODE solver that's calling your dynamics function and your event function. So the convention is that your dynamics function and your event function have to have the same calling signature. So in this case, they both accept TZ, or, or like T end state. And so there's my function and there's my event. They have the same, they both accept two inputs. If I wanted to use my um, simple 
golf directly and instead give it my args like that, that's fine as far as that goes, but it's going to crap out because the event function doesn't take this extra argument, and so it doesn't like that. And so to fix that, I guess I could um, add a, a third argument to my event function that's just ignored. Now it's okay with it. So they just have to match. Right. Okay. So now let's go to sort of an interesting model. So this is a, uh, an animation of the whole thing. I've got um, this function. This is the Nolte Golf driving range. I've got this function barrier height, which I talked about before. Um, I've got... Um, this is the dynamics function for golf. I've got an event function for hitting the ground. And I've got an event function for the barrier, all that stuff here. I created wrapper. I'm using the wrapper version here, but if I were to rewrite this, I would have used the args method. So you might recognize this as the event function that we talked about, the sort of more elegant event function for the hitting the barrier. And then it just calls um, solve IVP repeatedly in a loop. Um, I'm using a max step. So this is um, kind of interesting. So one thing I need to be careful about is it's taking these steps and I don't want it to take large, large steps that are so large that it actually steps right over my barrier. If this is my barrier, I don't want it to go step, 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 because the event function will never evaluate negative in that case. I need to take step sizes so that my, I know what my x velocity is, so I need to take step sizes so that I can't step more than the width of my barrier, more than one meter in a single time step. So that's what, that's what this is here. Is, um, basically, I'm taking times, max step is, uh, 1 over 4, whatever, I'm not sure why it chose 4, but for whatever reason, there it is. And then this thing animates and then shows the animation. So let's see what this looks like. Oh, got hit there. So you can see it stops when it uh, triggers the uh, event. Either it triggers the hitting the barrier, <clears throat> or if it makes it past the barrier, it triggers the hitting the ground event. So it's kind of fun to watch these. But alas, we should move on. Okay, that's how you use the SciPy's ODE suite inside Solve IVP. Lots of fun, and uh, you can use that on your assignment. Enjoy.